um, came to me, the goodness of God. Um, and just um, this last week, four times David Wilkinson had about mercy. We had it Sunday, and it was like, okay, God, this is about your mercy, your mercy and your, your loving kindness. And, and I don't know, but the goodness of God came to my heart. So I wanted to share three scriptures, and then um, a couple, read something about it, one song in particular. So um, just listen, and the first one's from First Chronicles. It's chapter 16, verse 34. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy and loving kindness endure forever. That same theme about who God is. Psalm 145, verse 9. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works, the entirety of things created. That's the Amplified Bible. All of his works, the whole thing, everything that he's created. And this is from Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7. The Lord is good. A strength and a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows, recognizes, has knowledge of, and understands those who take refuge and trust in him. As I said, last week was all about mercy, mercy, mercy. Kept reflecting and reflecting on repeating that. And just how awesome is our God? How awesome is he? And I thought about the goodness of God. Um, he's always good, no matter what's happening in our lives. He will always be good. He is so good, he's so good to me. We've sung that song, God is so good, he's so good to me to me, to all of you. That's a personal. He's a personal God who's always good to all of us. Because of his goodness, we can seek him and believe in the gospel about Jesus who came, he died, he rose again, and he lives in us through his power of the Holy Spirit. His goodness opens up our hearts, our minds to the truth when we read his word. And also, I came to mind this song about the goodness of love. It's um, Jen Johnson. It's from the Bethel Music. And it start, I'll read the words to you, the lyrics. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. So that's my thought for you today as we enter our worship time, how good God is, how good he is to us. And also the goodness of God, we're able to, because of the power of the Holy Spirit, be good to others. You know, God says, I, I give, I'm good to you. Be good to others. You know, that's part of the characteristic of God. And as we know Jesus better, that goodness will come to us to be for others. So we'll start, I'll pray for you for the service right now. And I say, Father God, thank you for being so good. Your goodness is all we need every day. Open our hearts, our minds today as we're here to worship and adore you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, turn in your Bibles to the book of Colossians chapter three. And it is on page 1167 in the Pew Bible. And I am going to ask you to put your finger in there for a little bit as we bounce around to 
begin. So let's bow our heads. Come let us bow. Let us kneel before our maker. Thank you for your holy word, Lord God, and what it is for us. Bless it this day, Lord God, that it would speak to each heart according to that which is in it for them. Bless us, Lord God, as we lift it up before you and seek your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I got to tell you, last Sunday, it was awesome. And thank you so much for the feedback. You know, Louise, Louise couldn't wait to get home and tell Andy to read Isaiah 59 and to talk about it. Gail Katniss, I learned during the week that she suggested that um, Charlie and Mary Sutton watch the YouTube, uh, the video on our Facebook page during the week. Chuck Frisk, he listens to the radio, all kinds of secular talk, political talk. And in his response to me after the service, he said, were you listening to that radio station this week, Pastor? And I said, no, I wasn't. I was listening to God. And he says, well, you really had your finger on the pulse. And I said, I hope it's sh uh, shed some scriptural light on what you listened to and participated in. And Nancy Green, she, again, if she says anything to me, it's usually dipped in sarcasm before it comes out of her mouth. <laughs> but she said, I wish the whole nation could have heard that message today. And the words just came to my mind. Who am I? I mean, really, who am I? That was a good sermon, too, a long time ago. It was about a year ago, I think. It, Paul said, it's only by God's grace that I am what I am. And I paraphrased uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 10 a little bit. Paul said, it is only by God's grace that I am what I am. And when I take full advantage of his favor shown to me, it becomes a blessing for those to whom it is intended. I like that a lot. I'm going to save that. And so I thought, how do I follow that up? No pressure. Because if I have pressure, it comes from within me. So I just asked God, I says, I don't know what to do. I'm tired. I really need vacation time. I'm looking forward so much to walking away from as much of this as I possibly can, just for a while, just to relax and let my mind come down to ground zero. And I think it was maybe Wednesday or Thursday that the, the words logos, ethos, pathos came to me. Logos, ethos, pathos. It's in a book that I read a long time ago about preaching. And logos, in spiritual terms, refers to the living word of God. To the words in this book, which are not just words in a book, they are the living word of God. They are the word of the living God to mankind. Some call it God's love letter to mankind. And ethos means what we are as people, what I am as a person. And then pathos is my personal passion and conviction to the word. Logos, the word comes, the word is spoken out. The word is discerned, understood, and then preached from, from my perspective. And I must ingest that. It, it must affect what I am as a person. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates 
to the division that exists within each one of us between our soul, our mind, our emotions, our thoughts, our personality, and the spirit of the living God. Penetrates to that place where they're separated. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart, and nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So when it comes to the logos, because we take it in through our eyes and through our ears into our souls, and there is a division between that and the spirit, our souls must react and respond to the living word of God. Because what speaks to our hearts is very personal. What speaks to you this morning will be very personal for you and what you need because the word of God is alive and active. And we must give account to the one who sees all, knows all. Remember when he spoke to the church of Laodicea? Laodicea? He said, I know your deeds. And in the song that we sing, I know your thoughts, your deeds. Your works are lukewarm. And so the one who knows our souls will speak to us by his living word. And then, then, it, it is where ethos comes in, what we are as a person. And the one who bows a knee to the word and says, this is what I need to adjust to, this is what I need to respond to with my personality, with my person, then the word changes something within us. But the soul that says, I hear it, but I don't want to hear it right now. Thank you very much. That's a good idea, but I don't have a problem there. Hey, and look, as long as we go on, there are going to be things in our lives that we are not willing to completely submit to when it comes to the Word of God. That's the truth. That's the truth. Paul said to the Galatian church, my dear children, for who I am once again in the travail of pangs of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I want Christ as he desires to be manifest in you and formed in you to happen for each and every one of you more and more and more and more. It's a process of growth for us individually and for us as a church, as a body representative of the Lord Jesus here in Douglas. And so as we become more like Christ, there is a fullness of manifestation of Christ in our midst. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, Paul said this to that church. So Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The body, not you, not you, not you, not me, the full embodiment of the person of Jesus Christ cannot occur in one individual person, one individual believer, but it manifests itself in the corporation, the corporateness of us as a whole unit of the body. And so that we might, we might attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. No one is perfectly embodying Jesus Christ in this life. So this is a very personal thing. The word that you hear, the word that you ingest, 
and your personal response to it develops Christ within you or inhibits it when our hearts are hard and our souls are stubborn and our attitudes are wrong, he's held back. And it's a very personal thing, and there's something for clarification here in understanding the personalness of this between a person, a believer, and God. I read a, um, a little illustration about a train conductor. Now, this train conductor, day after day after day after day, would get out of the train and look up and down the platform and when everybody it looked like was done with their business, he'd get up and then he'd, all aboard, and then he'd look out one more time to make sure there was nobody running to catch the train and then he'd give the signal to the conductor, uh, to the engineer to go. And he'd, first stop, Everett. First stop, second stop, Blue Hills. And he'd call out again and again and again the names of all these places, all these towns. And there's a great little romantic movie called Next Stop Wonderland. It always reminds me of train conductors. Next stop, Wonderland. But over time, that conductor came to believe that he had been to all those places that he called out day after day after day after day, even though half of them he'd never visited. But he had that feeling like, because he knew the name and knew where it was and all that stuff, he, like he'd been there. Well, it's the same way with the Word of God. I think about how the Baptists had their sword drills. And while those things are good, rote repetition of the Word of God and memorizing, just memorizing it for the simply, simple be act of being able to recite it back to get your star, it's not the purpose of the Word of God. It's alive and active, and it changes our souls. It connects our soul with His Spirit. It should never be just a mechanical thing, a duty thing. The Word of God must touch us in our inmost being and change us, conform us into the image of Christ. Someone once said to me, why is it that you're always sharing stuff about you and your life and your experiences and stuff like that? You talk about yourself way too much in your sermons. Isn't that when it becomes real? When my experience of having a victory, a success, a manifestation of the reality of these things in my experience makes it real to you too. Even my failures, even my willing to, just willingness to admit to you that my heart is sometimes stubborn and I don't want to conform because of me, because of myself and selfishness. So when my ethos in my experience is shaped by God's word over time, and I can share that with you, doesn't that become the reality of pathos, the reality of conviction of Christ in my life? And that is a beautiful thing. And so I don't hesitate to share the things that God's word speaks to me and how I have, over time, gained footholds here in this area of my life, and I'm still struggling to let the Lord have foothold and rule and reign over these areas of my life. And I can't tell you how many times that stupid word comes to me. Pick up your cross. And follow me. Not always easy.
Because we are stubborn people. We are strong-willed people. Oh, that my will was as strong in the area of conforming to the Word of God and loving Him like I should as it is to getting what I want in this life. And it's not only me. It belongs to each and every one of us. It, it, it consumed Paul so much that he says, I'm in the travail of childbirth once again with you people, that Christ might be formed in you. And listen, I am blessed with a beautiful flock, a loving, kind, compassionate, mature group of people. So I'm not talking down to anybody. I'm just encouraging us, encouraging us to go further and further and further and to understand that we're part of developing a fullness of Christ in this place and what it is he wants us to be or what it is that he wants to be in us in this place. And this is the scripture that spoke to me so long ago. So Christ himself gave some to be pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of God. Now let's go to our scripture. Colossians 3, verses 15 through 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There is a lot that comes before that little section of scripture, but that is like the summation. Peace with God because of his love and forgiveness and the freedom to serve him that comes as a result of that. Let the peace of Christ, that you are at peace with God, your heavenly father, period, because he loves and cares for you and he gave his son for you. May that rule in your hearts so that you can concentrate on doing good things, the good works that he has had in mind for you since before you were ever even created. And we are to embrace that fact and share that with the other people with whom we live and function daily and give thanks in all things. There's one section up above Therefore, as God's chosen people, no. He says, don't lie to one another. Don't lie to one another. I thought, what the heck does that mean? Did they go around just lying? No, no, it's about religiosity. He's talking about reli religiosity here. He's saying, this is not mechanical. When you get together, understand that you're, each, you're all in a struggle. You're all working to have Christ manifest in your life. And to, you're doing the best job you can do. You're doing, there's no, 
set instruction manual for it, save the word of God, and our fellowship with one another where we encourage one another along in the struggles that we have. And we don't lie to each other by coming here and saying, bless you, brother. Oh, I'm great. Thank you so much. Such a, such a blessing to be a part of God's church family here. Well, that's true. However, but the fact that peace with God comes through Jesus Christ and it's all about Christ manifesting himself in our midst, that matters more than anything. Verse 16, we're all growing and being shaped into Christ's image. Let us encourage each other. I guess I covered that already, jumping ahead. Bear with one another in that process. Isn't that Ephesians 4 too? Oh, well. That the Logos in verse 17, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to him through God the Father. That the Logos would shape our ethos and result in good works done passionately to the glory of the Son of God. That's what we're here for. And this all came together kind of because of what we came to a, an enlightening moment with last week when, from Isaiah 59. And the realization of the truth of the decline of our culture. It's enmity with God. It's total disregard for the blessings of this life that come from him. And how just that in itself can become a creator of fear within us because we know things are not going to get better. Paul said, you know, all these things must pass so that the man of lawlessness might be revealed. That's where it's going. The revelation of the lawlessness and the increase of all these troubles, they will happen. And we need to be fed in our spirits by the living word of God. More than just a nibble here and a bite there. Because if we're going to get through this time that is coming, that we have been called to. We were born for this time and this place according to God's plan, then we must feed our soul and our spirit because there may well come a day when we who trust so much in the blessings of God that we trust in ourselves because they have been imparted to us will be able to put our full trust in him when there is nothing but trust in God left. And that day may well come. We cannot see it, but that could be the reality when things that we know and take for granted and our cert put our certainty in, when they fail, where do you go? Feed your soul so that your trust, so that, you, so that when you say, my God will provide all your needs according to his riches in Christ. That it's not just a sword drill. That it's something you have come and made your ethos part of your personality. When your first impulse is to check and see what the stock market did. Because that affects you. My word to you is feed your spirit. Feed your soul with the word and say, thank you for what I have today, Lord God. Help me to keep my mind fixed on that. You are my provider. You are Jehovah Jireh in my life. And I will trust in no one but you for what I have. And I want to see your glory manifest in our midst. I want to see your hand move in our midst when people are in trouble, when people, when we can help someone with what we have. And not worry about tomorrow, but worry about what you have given me today. 
And God is able to make grace abound to you more and more in all things. So as we do these things, he will show himself to us. And that will feed our spirits so that our pathos increases more and more, knowing that if we trust God, he will bless again and again and again and again. And I so give thanks to him for his word. And I so good give thanks for my vacation coming up. <laughs> really, I'm grateful. Let's listen to the Apostle Paul's words of thanksgiving that he spoke to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given us strength that he considered us faithful and appointed us to his service. Even though Paul was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, he was shown mercy because he acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on him and on us abundantly, along with the faith and love that are his in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you.